it's Tori here, or Professor Nokes to some of you, um, coming to you from my office today. Um, today I want to talk a little bit more about the mathematics behind doing eight perfect Faroe shovels. Now I made a video about this uh, a year ago, and I'll put a link in the, the info <laughs> down here, um, so you can go check that out. Um, but here's, here's, here's what's going on. Um, it's a well-known fact amongst, amongst magicians that if you take um, a deck of playing cards and divide it exactly into two packets of 26 and square them up just right, that if you perform what we call a perfect pharaoh shuffle, where you get the cards exactly one and one, like this, that um, this shuffles what we as mathematicians call a permutation of order eight. That if you perform this eight times in a row, that will return the deck to the original order. So um, in my last video, I explained this phenomenon using um, a branch of mathematics called combinatorics, which is the study of counting. And we discussed um, this uh, permutation in terms of its disjoint cycle decomposition and looked at the different cycles formed by the different uh, movements of the cards. So today I want to explain it a little bit differently. We're going to use something called modular arithmetic. So we're going to get started with a few uh, definitions in order to understand it. And then I will once again demonstrate the eight perfect pharaoh shuffles. So let's start by talking a little bit about modular arithmetic. Now this is sort of a basis of a branch of mathematics we call number theory which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a study of numbers. Um, and modular arithmetic sounds like a fancy thing, and it is fancy, uh, but it's not terribly difficult to understand. It's something, in fact, we do in everyday life a lot without even thinking about it. Uh, for example, if it was 10 a.m. right now and I asked you, hey, what time is it gonna be in six hours from now? You would probably pretty readily answer, oh, it'll be four o'clock. And what you're doing there is an instance of modular arithmetic. You're wrapping around at 12. We do it on clocks all the time. Or even if you use 24 hour time, um, if it was 22 o'clock and I asked you, hey, um, eight hours from now, what time is it gonna be? You still have to wrap around at 24. You get back to zero. Um, so the answer to that should be six. So here's the first piece of notation I want to introduce. It's this mod operator. Mod is short for modular. Um, it's that if m and n are integers, that we say m mod n is the remainder when you do m divided by n. So you may have to dig back into your elementary education on arithmetic a little bit um, and recall that when you divide two numbers, uh, that you'll always have a remainder. Sometimes the remainder is zero, um, like when m is divisible by n. But um, in general, you're always going to get some integer number. So here's the cool thing about remainders, is not only do you always get an integer, you always have uh, this inequality that your remainder always has to sit between 0 and n minus 1. And you can think about why that makes sense, because um, if you could get a higher remainder, there's another n sitting in there that you could, that you could divide out. Okay, so we'll see some examples in a moment. Um, but this is going to be a really important fact for us, and, and the reason is that ultimately what we're going to want to do is our, explain uh, the action of our, of our perfect out pharaoh um, by way of this modular arithmetic, and being able to take it mod something is going to allow us to keep the number small and under control in a reasonable way. So I want to build upon this example from Telling Time, um, where if I ask you when it's 10 a.m., what time it's going to be six hours from now, um, hopefully you answered four o'clock. <laughs> um, but uh, the process which you use to arrive at that might not be totally obvious to you, but let's explore that. So what you may be doing in your head um, when calculating that is you may be thinking, okay, um, 10 plus 6 is going to give me 16. But there's no 16 o'clock, it wraps around every 12. So I'm going to subtract off that 12, which is going to leave me with 4. Okay, so equivalently, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, take that 16 divided by 12. 16 divided by 12 will be 1 with a remainder of 4. Uncoincidentally, that remainder is exactly the piece of information you need. So really what you're doing is you're calculating 16 mod 12, which 
Again, you do so by dividing by 12. Um, and if you want to work that out, you can. <laughs> um, with your handy old long division, right? But there's your remainder right there. So you get that 16 mod 12 is equal to four. And that's how you get that four o'clock. So let's try an example with a bigger number. Um, let's try calculating 89 mod 12. So again, we can use the exact same process that we just thought of. And if you need to motivate this, you can, you can think about like, okay, what if I want to know um, what time on the clock it's going to be after 89 hours? Now, this won't precisely give you what you want. Um, this piece of information won't tell you if it's going to be AM or PM. You need a little bit more. You need to know um, if it's an even or odd number of 12s. Um, but um, again, the point is that you want to calculate that remainder when you divide by 12. So we can do this, again, directly with long division. Um, so that's going to be what, 7? So we get something like this, this 5. Okay, so we know that the remainder is going to be 5. But another way that we can calculate this, and another maybe even more intuitive way to consider this problem, is to think about the fact that what this is saying is that um, I can rewrite 89 as 7 times 12 plus 5. And this is an instance of what we call the quotient remainder theorem, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you have your quotient, 7, and your remainder, 5, appear in this problem when I'm doing 89 divided by 12. Okay, so um, all the information appears here in a unique way, which is very useful to us. And remember, this remainder is between, between 0 and 11, okay? Um, because if it was 12 or more, we could fold that into this part of the equation. Okay, so equivalently, another way I can think about how I can get this piece of information is I can rewrite this and I can say, okay, well look, um, 89 minus 7 times 12 is equal to this 5. So the idea that I'm trying to convey here, and a different way we can think about calculating uh, this modular arithmetic, is you can say, okay, I want to know 89 mod 12. Well, what I can do is take this number 89 and subtract 12 as many times as I can until I arrive at a number that sits between 0 and 11. And this will always have a solution. Um, this is exactly, actually exactly the statement of the quotient remainder theorem, is that this is always possible uh, to set up an equation like this, or equivalently, an equation like this. So you can always calculate um, a problem like this uh, just by subtracting this number off as many times as you can until you arrive at, um, at a number sitting between 0 and this number minus 1. So to exhibit this relationship between subtracting off multiples of 12 and finding this um, remainder, I want to work that, work that out here. So again, we have this equation which we can get just from performing the long division. But equivalently, we can arrive at whatever this number needs to be by subtracting 12 as many times as we can to maintain a positive integer between 0 and 11. So let's just let's try that out. So I'm going to have 89 uh, minus 12, which will give me 77. And then I'm going to subtract 12 again, which should give me 65. Um, let's subtract 12 again, which should give me 53. Okay, then I'm going to come up here. So 53 minus 12 is going to be 41, and then minus 12 again. Um, we carry this guy over, we should get 29. Minus 12 will be 17. One more time. Minus 12 will give us 5. So look, if you just keep subtracting off 12s, eventually you're going to arrive at, um, at this remainder. Okay? And uncoincidentally, I'm saying that a lot. There aren't a lot of coincidences in the way that this modular arithmetic works out. Um, I subtract a 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times. That was the 7 that was indicated here in this equation. Okay, so um, this is going to be really useful in sort of our observations about um, developing a formula for how our perfect pharaoh is going to work. Before we get to using this relationship between this sort of quotient remainder approach and this subtracting off multiples of whatever you're dividing by approach, um, 
thinking about modular arithmetic in order to um, describe the action of a perfect ferro shuffle, we need to talk a little bit about the different types of perfect ferro shuffles. So it turns out there's two. Um, they're called in ferros and out ferros. And what we're going to be studying in this in this video is what we call an out ferro. So remember, a perfect ferro shuffle is one in which you split the deck into um, two packets of 26, and then you weave the cards one and one, and then complete the shuffle. But here's the thing, is that um, I have two choices to how I can start that weaving process. I can do it such that this bottom card, this ace of spades, stays on the bottom as I perform my pharaoh, and that's what we call an out pharaoh, the ace of spades stays on the outside, or I can perform what we call an in pharaoh, where my bottom card gets woven in and becomes the new second card um, from the bottom. Okay, so um, like I said, we're gonna be studying out pharaohs, which look like this. Okay, so see this ace of spades was on the bottom and it stays on the bottom. And incidentally, we've got the ace of hearts on the top, that's also gonna stay on the top, right? Because this was the top packet over here and so, um, uh, the top packet, the top card of this packet will stay, will stay on the top um, after performing this shuffle. Okay, so um, again, this is an out pharaoh. If I wanted to perform an in pharaoh, I would have to do this shuffle such that the uh, the old bottom card gets woven into the inside. So that would be um, that'd be something like this, where it becomes the second card. Okay, so. This video is on out pharaohs, which, like I mentioned, is what we call permutation of order eight, and we'll use that modular arithmetic to explain why we have to do it eight times to get back our original order. Um, it turns out the in pharaoh, which I'm saving for a later video, uh, requires 52 of them to get back to your original order. Um, so after you watch today's video, you should have the tools necessary to prove that, um, but I'll go ahead and make a video about it eventually. So, um, we can number our cards um, from 0 to 51. I'm going to go ahead and start at 0. In my last video, I numbered them from 1 to 52 because I didn't want it mattering. Uh, but you'll see why in a moment, um, why this is kind of an advantageous uh, numbering system for our purposes with this, uh, with this modular arithmetic. So, um, we have our cards here. And then we want to think about, after performing one perfect pharaoh, how this is going to look. Okay? So, what we get... Um, so what we get is the following. Um, uh, after performing this perfect pharaoh, remember we're doing out pharaohs, which means that um, the bottom card stays the bottom card, so card zero stays card zero, and the top card stays the top card, so 51 stays 51. Um, but after that, you have this alternation of the bottom half of the deck and the top half of the deck. So the bottom half of the deck uh, lends itself really nicely to sort of a formulaic approach. In particular, that um, zero goes to zero, and then you introduce a new card, which means that one goes to two, and then you get another card. So two is gonna go to four, etc. So for the bottom half of the deck, um, you can see the pattern quite quickly that um, the position number will just multiply by two. And this is among various reasons that we wanna start at zero, because that rule still holds at zero. Two times zero is zero. If I'd start at one, this would've gone less nicely. So, so far, for formula, F, F is for pharaoh. Uh, oh boy, okay. So for the formula, it's gonna be two times X when X ranges between zero and 25, which remember, that's the bottom half of the deck. It's the bottom 26 cards, because we start at zero. Okay, but then we need a rule for the top half. And this is a little bit more subtle, and this is going to require a little bit of um, cleverness in order to find. So, look, um, this 2x rule should sort of reasonably work, but the problem is that if I multiply this by 2, um, I'm going to get a number outside of my range. It's going to be more than 51, right? 26 times 2 is going to be 52. But turns out if I subtract off 51, that's gonna put me in the exact right position. And you can think about why this makes sense because really what's happening, if you isolate your attention to just the, this half of the deck, you're doing the exact same thing that you're doing to the bottom half. You're, you're putting a new card between 
all of them. Okay, so that's going to double their position length. But then you're also removing all these cards off the front. Okay, as a way you can think about that. So what you're going to get here for the rest of them is it is in fact 2x, but you have to subtract off 51 for this kind of wraparound that you're experiencing. So this is going to be minus 51, and that's when x ranges between 26 and 51. Okay, so um, you can, you can, I just broke this marker. So for our top half of the deck for these purple cards, um, you can check explicitly that this formula is in fact going to give you the right positions. Um, but you can even just think about um, a few test cases and about why this is going to make sense. For example, uh, 27 times 2 um, is going to be 54, which minus 51 is 3, and 27 does in fact go to position 3. Right? And again, starting at zero is what makes this numbering work out correctly in this sort of succinct way. Um, and you can even check that this works for your final card, your 51, um, which 2 times 51 is going to be 102 minus 51 is 51. So you get back to your original position for 51, which is exactly what we expected. Um, so this is going to be a formula for the action of our perfect pharaoh shuffle. But this is kind of annoying to have these cases um, lurking around, okay? So what we want to do is boil this down by taking advantage of modular arithmetic. So I've rewritten our formula here and written down a little claim for how I think we can clean this up. Now, um, so close. We almost get a single unified formula for every value of x, but it turns out we have to handle a special case for the very last card. So this is going to work for 51 of the cards for x between 0 and 50, and then that last card is just going to be fixed in place. And we'll see why in a little bit. And this is actually um, kind of important towards understanding uh, this kind of relationship that we're relying on with modular arithmetic and subtracting off multiples of your divisor. Um, but let's let's talk through um, this claim I've made, which turns out is not outrageous at all, because uh, I'm going to justify it. So here we go. Um, what I'm saying is that I think that we can um, describe this relationship uh, via just 2x mod 51. And this, um, what we're going to do is examine why, um, why this is going to give us the right thing for most values of x, and why it's actually going to give us the wrong thing at 51, so we have to handle a case separately. So first let's look at when x ranges between 0 and 25. Okay, so if I multiply that number by 2, for any of these x's, the values that I'm going to get here are just going to be 0, 2, 4, all the way up to when x is 25, this is going to give me 50. Okay, so this is the range of this part of the function. And look at what the convenient thing is here. Remember what we said, the sort of observation about modular arithmetic is that um, when, you, when you take a number mod 51, the answer is gonna range from zero to 50. And look where all these numbers fall. They all fall between zero and 50, precisely. So if I hit any of those numbers with a mod 51, it's just gonna spit back out the same number. So because for this part of my domain, um, I'm evaluating just by multiplying by two, if I do two x and then take that number mod 51, I'm gonna get back the same number. So this will in fact hold for um, this part of my function. Okay, so that bodes well. Then for the next part of my function, I need to think about, um, what is the range of these numbers, okay? So in particular, I'm gonna focus on this 2x, okay? And as I go from 26, and I'm just gonna go up to 50, again, I'll handle 51 separately. Um, but as I think about 2x, 2 times 26, I'm gonna go 52, 54, um, 56, etc. cetera. Um, et cetera, all the way up to 100, okay? So again, if I think about taking these numbers mod 51, what's going to happen is that I'm going to subtract off one multiple of 51, and then that's going to be it, um, because then I'm going to fall in a range of um, 0 to 50. Okay, so if I take these numbers mod 51, what I'm going to get, what I'm going to get here is 1, 3, 5, etc. Um, all the way up to 100 mod 51 is going to be uh, 49. Okay, so um, 
these are going to give me the positions of all of these cards. If I take the mod 51, because I'm only subtracting one multiple of 51. Okay? So that means that this formula will work when x ranges from 26 to 50. So that's good. Okay? But then I have to worry about um, the number 51 itself. And here's where we run into trouble. Because if I do 2 times 51 mod 51, I'm going to get 0. It's divisible by 51, right? It's 51 times an integer. So the problem is if I plug 51 in this formula, it's going to give me 0, which is incorrect. The 51st card does not live at position 0 after a perfect pharaoh. It lives at position 51. So I do have to handle this case separately. This rule works for all but the last card. Okay, and it turns out that using this in order to explain our, our eight perfect pharaohs, it, it, this is not going to be a problem, okay? But I would be remiss in my duties as a mathematician if I didn't bring this up as a, as a special case in our formula. We have one more number theoretic fact we need um, in order to take advantage of our modular arithmetic formula for the positions of the cards after the perfect out pharaoh. Uh, in order to show that performing it eight times will return us to the original order. So that fact is this one, and it looks a little bit technical. This is definitely the most um, mathematically technical part of this video. So bear with me while I go through it. I will explain what this is saying, and I'm also going to give a proof of it. So um, what this is saying, so let's look at this side. It's a little bit more complicated. It's saying that if I take a number B and I divide by N and look at the remainder, and then I multiply that number by A, and then I divide by n again and take the remainder of that product divided by n. That that's the same thing as if I just multiply a and b and then divide by n and look at that remainder. Okay, so in other words, what this is saying is that I can multiply first and then take a remainder, or I can take a remainder as I go along and then multiply it and then take the remainder again. And then those two processes will yield the same answer. So now I'm going to prove it, and like I warned you, this is a little bit technical, so please try to bear with me. Um, for ease of notation, I'm going to call this number r, okay? And note that r is a number between uh, 0 and n minus 1. And in fact, this is a proof, it's the unique integer between 0 and n minus 1, which satisfies the following equation. Uh, we'll call this q n plus r, where this q is some integer. Okay, and this is just the quotient remainder theorem um, that we talked about a little bit at the beginning. So um, we have this equation here, and what we want is that when I multiply these two numbers, I arrive at that same remainder. Okay, so I'm going to take advantage of this b mod n and look at the fact that this is also part of a quotient remainder theorem type equation. So in other words, this tells me that I could write b as some other possibly integer times n plus this remainder b mod n where this k is also some integer okay um, so what i'm going to do is substitute this in for the value of b um, okay so i get a times kn plus b mod n and then that's equal to qn plus r, okay? And then I'm going to um, distribute and move some things around. So let me just write those steps down. I'm going to distribute this a here. Um, it's still equal to qn plus r. And then I'm going to move this over to the other side by subtracting it. And I'm going to pull out an n. I'm going to combine like terms with this qn. So what I get is that a times b mod n is equal to, so this is going to be q minus ak times n, and then I get a plus r over here. So look at what this equation is now. It's this product, it's this number times this number on the left here, and then q minus ak, all those numbers are integers, so that, that guy is also an integer. So some integer times n, and then this r, still sits between 0 and n minus 1. So the quotient remainder theorem tells me that this number is unique. There's only one um, value from 0 to n minus 1, which could um, make it such that this equation has some integer here satisfying it. So 
the quotient remainder theorem tells me that this has to be the remainder when I divide this number by r, which is exactly what this half of the expression is telling me. It's that product mod n. Okay, so the uniqueness that we get out of the quotient remainder theorem um, tells us exactly that this r is in fact this remainder, which is what we want. So it becomes a box, or if you prefer, QED. So this is the fact we're gonna take advantage of. Now's the fun part. Well, I hope all of it has been the fun part. But this part is particularly fun because now's the payoff for the sort of number theory we've built up to understand this. So here's our function for the perfect pharaoh. Okay, and I again I put f of 51 is 51 over here uh, because this rule doesn't apply when x equals 51, but it applies for all the other x's. So um, let's study this guy. So what, what are we trying to do? What is the goal? Well, our goal is to show that if we perform this function eight times, that's going to return every single x to its original position, right? So a way we can articulate that is that if we start with some x, that if we apply f to it eight times, that we're going to get x back. So that's going to look like this. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so if we do that eight times, that um, our input is equal to our output, that it just puts it back in the original order. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Well, in this case, in the case when x ranges from zero to 50, it means that if I multiply by two eight times, four, five, eight, and then I take that mod 51 every single time, so I'm running out of room, but um, say eight times. Okay, what we want is that that needs to be equal to the original x. Okay, but here's where we get to take advantage of the fact that we just proved, that we don't have to take the remainder at every single step. We can multiply and then take the remainder at the end. Okay, so what this equation winds up looking like is that if I multiply by two, eight times times x, that that's the same as if um, that, and then I take it mod 51, that that's going to give me x back. Okay. So equivalently, what I need to show is that 2 to the 8 times x mod 51 is equal to x. Okay. So um, I am going to break this down a little bit more. So if I look at 2 to the 8x mod 51, well, I can use that same fact in reverse, that the product of these is the same as if I take um, one of the mod 51 and then take the product mod 51. Okay, so this is just that, that same fact that we proved right before we started in on, on this stuff. Okay, so here's the reason I did that, is that 2 to the 8th is a really nice number. It's 256 mod 51. Okay, and you can sort this out a few different ways, um, but the nice thing is that 51 goes into 256 uh, five times with a remainder of 1. Okay, there's that long division. So this number is 1. So we get x times 1 mod 51, which is just x mod 51. Well, we already talked about this, that if you take a number that ranges from 0 to 50, like our x specifically does, then uh, this is just going to be x. And again, this is since x is from 0 to 50. So this is precisely what we were trying to show, that if I apply this perfect pharaoh eight times, that's equivalent to saying two to the eighth times x, but mod 51, and um, that winds up being exactly equivalent to just getting back your original x. So this is exactly what we wanted. Um, one more thing you gotta worry about is when x is 51, but you get that one for free, right? Because if f of 51 is 51, if I apply it eight times, say it like this, f of f of f, f of 51, 
if I try to do that eight times, well, every time I apply F, I'm just gonna get back 51 again. So no matter how many times I apply F, this is still gonna be equal to 51. So it turns out that you get back X no matter what you plug in. So in other words, after performing eight perfect pharaohs, you should get back your original order. This is the really fun part. Um, I went ahead and put my cards in new deck order, so ace through king, uh, ascending, and then descending. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and perform these eight perfect pharaohs. And in particular, we're going to pay attention to the position of the two of spades. Now, this is a kind of an obvious choice because in the starting order, the two of spades is in position number one, right? Remember, the ace of spades is at zero. So after n perfect pharaohs, it should be at two to the n mod 51. And I've written those numbers down here so that we can check on its progress as we, as we proceed. So here we go. Here's our first one. Okay, and remember it's important that these cards are exactly one and one, um, or it's not gonna work. So there we go, and let's see how we did. So um, again, our um, two spades, we performed one, so it's two mod 51, which is just two. So we see zero, one, two, there's our two spades in the second position, so that, that's good. So let's keep going. So in our next, after our next pharaoh, um, the two of spades should be in position two squared mod 51, which is four mod 51. All right, there we go. So let's check it out. So we've got zero, one, two, three, four. Perfect. Okay, um, let's keep going. So next is um, two cubed, which is eight. Okay, there's our pharaoh. So now, let's see how we get. So now the two spades, we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, position eight, good. So notice, while the two spades is still um, in the bottom half of the deck, um, its position is just uh, doubling in index. Um, we haven't reached the crossover where that mod 51 is making a difference yet. Okay, so there's um, our fourth one. Now we should be oops, at uh, position 16. So we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, perfect. And you can see at this stage that we're halfway through, we've done four of our eight pharaohs, and the cards are pretty mixed at this juncture. Um, but now they're gonna start to um, reassemble in that, in that new deck order. So here comes number five. All right, there it is. And now um, our two should be at position 32. So we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. There it is. So um, notice now it has moved to the bottom half of the deck. So now when we perform our next pharaoh, um, we'll have to take that number times two mod 51 in order for it to correctly calculate the position of the two of spades. So um, this next one we can think of as two to the six, which is 64, um, or two times 32, which is also 64. Either way, we have to take that mod um, 51 in order to get the correct position. So 64 mod 51 is 13, which we've got right here. So there we go. And let's see how we did. So now our two spades, one, sorry, zero. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Perfect. So now it's back in the bottom half again. So that's nice. Um, all right, let's see. So we've only got two more till completion. Um, so let's do this one. So our next um, will be uh, 
13 times 2, which is 26, it's just 2 times the previous position, or equivalently, it's uh, 2 to the 7th, which is 128, mod 51, which is 26. So let's see how we did. So our two spades should be at 26, which is halfway, but we can check. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Perfect. And you can see at this point, we've only got one pharaoh left. The cards have really reassembled. They're very close to their original order. And it's even not tough to see how one more iteration of this is going to put these cards back between these and return us to our, our original new deck order. So here we go. Here's the last one. And this one will correspond to 2 to the 8th, which is 256, which we know is equivalent to um, 1 mod 51. So here it comes. All right, let's see. Ah, beautiful. All right, so there's our new deck order again. And there's our two spades, exactly where we expected to be, along with everything else. And that is uh, eight perfect out pharaohs. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed my video and I hope you learned a little bit about modular arithmetic. Um, like I promised, you should now have the tools in order to show that 52 in pharaohs um, will return you to your new deck order. Um, I will make a video about that when I get brave enough to perform 52 in a row. But in the meantime, please uh, like my video if you enjoyed it, subscribe, follow me on all the other media. There'll be links down here. And thanks again for watching.